Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said. Skip down to verse 36. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Israel. Thus far the scripture, the word of God for the people of God, Thanks be unto God. I want to talk today on this third Sunday of Advent. I want to try to talk from this subject, a proper response. We are in the third Sunday of Advent, the time of acknowledging and uh, celebrating the coming of Jesus Christ into the world. As believers, we can never forget that Jesus Christ coming into the world was, first of all, by plan and design of God. Secondly, it was for the benefit of the world. And thirdly, it was to offer hope into hopelessness. What do I mean by that? Without Christ uh, coming and dying in our place, no hope to overcome sin would have been possible. There is no way we as human beings can conquer and overcome sin of our own ability. And you all are quiet already. And just because I said sin, you got nervous? I didn't name yours. There is, there is no way for us to overcome sin of our own accord. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many scriptures you try to memorize and quote. Sin cannot be, con cannot be conquered apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ, his advent, his first advent, his coming into the world was coming by on purpose. It was coming by design of God. It was coming for the benefit of the world. And he came in order to offer hope in the midst of hopelessness. The coming of Jesus into the world was not just planned. But it was announced. You know that. If you know your Bible, you know that various prophets declared. Isaiah said it repeatedly that there was this coming Messiah. So you had this proclamation throughout the Old Testament that this Messiah, this Savior, was coming to bring hope to a hopeless world. It was announced before it was experienced. But here is what I need you to catch, Robin. It is it was announced because it was planned. All right, y'all still missed it. That was a good place to get happy. It, it, you don't announce what is not planned. You announce what has been planned. And you only announce it after there has been the intent of something taking place. Why do you announce it when there is uh, an artist that's going to have a concert or a, a new album released? What happens? People set days in which they are announcing what's going to happen. The live recording shall be this day. The concert will be this day. The album will drop this day. The single will drop. But before they ever announce it, they have to plan. They plan and then they announce. All right, y'all still missing it. They plan, and then you announce. If you announce with no plan, 
there is great possibility for disappointment. Because if there's an announcement with no plan, then anything can happen and things don't work out. But when there is an announcement, after there has been planning, the announcement is not for the sake of the planning. The announcement is for the sake, watch this, of those who will benefit from what's been planned. So, so they announce it so that somebody who loves this artist can rearrange their schedule to go to the concert. They can rearrange their time to get to the recording or they can set aside their coins so they can go to iTunes and, y'all ain't talking to me, and purchase something. So the announcement is because of the plan, but the announcement is for the benefit of the recipients, not the one doing the planning. I told you, the coming of Jesus is both planned and it's announced. It's announced not for the benefit of heaven, but for the benefit of those of us on earth. All right, see, people don't get happy about Jesus as much as they used to get happy. But, 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 but here, let's try to put some self-interest there. Uh, here's the reality. When God has taken time out of his divine uh, schedule to, um, to plan and announce something in your life, he announces it to you for the purpose of doing at least two things. Number one, eliciting our participation. The Lord tells you what he's going to do. That's why he spoke to you about your future when you were still messed up. Oh, Lord, all right. That's why he spoke to you in the midst of your most difficult times and told you that good times were coming because even though God has planned something, God needs our participation in the plan he's already put together. So, so anytime the Lord announces something to you, he announces it because he's looking for you to participate. <sighs> Lord, I thought somebody's feet would get a little happy, your hands would start clapping. But, but maybe I'm not talking to a group of people who have had any announcements lately. Because when God has been announcing things to you, it begins to get you to this point that says, huh, maybe I should consider participating. So that's the, that's the first, the first, the first reason why he announces things that he has planned so he can elicit our participation. But secondly, I found that God announces some things to us in order to enable our faith. According to Romans 10 and 17, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You know that scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So consider this, if God never announced it to you, how could you have faith for it? That is why God has this desire to invade your mundane life, to invade your struggle, and he does not announce what is. He announces what will be because it doesn't take faith to believe for what you already have but it takes faith to believe beyond what you presently experience so when God is dealing with you and God has put forth effort to plan something for your future in order for you to have faith God can't keep silent Now, now, it's interesting, Deacon Owens, because it is not as if God needs us to do what God planned. 
but he allows us a chance to participate. But then he announces so we can have faith that what he has already purposed is possible for us. And so that is why, that is why you as a child of God can never allow your life's experiences to stop up your ears from hearing. I know, I know you may look at those children's report cards and the report card doesn't keep, get, doesn't get any better, seems to go get worse. But if you are believing God, never shut your ears to the potential of God to declare something different than what you're currently experiencing. I know you hear the doctor saying you have this condition. You see, and I know you hear the banker saying you don't qualify. I know you hear the people in HR saying you don't get this job. But the issue is they're talking about now and what they can control. But God has already had a plan. And the plan that God has is a plan that because he wants to elicit our participation and because he wants to enable our faith, he finally takes the moment, Lucretia, to announce what he has planned. And, and and let's be honest. I'm, I'm off track now, but let me work with it. Let's, let's be honest. When, when God begins to announce things to you, there are some moments in which the announcement seems to make great sense. And because it makes great sense, your reasonable emotional response is one of agreement and celebration. But there also are some times in which God's announcement is contrary to what you have. And you have to choose to decide, is your answer going to be yes or is your answer going to be, I don't know how that's going to happen. So God announces. I don't, I don't think, I don't think we quite get the importance of God announcing. Because announcements are made in order to allow change of actions. Announcements are made so that we can schedule and we can then attempt to plan as God has already planned. Are you tracking with me? That's why you announce. That's why you announce something. You send out. I, I, I got one uh, from a, a friend the other day. I got a wedding announcement. That's going to be in June. But they already put a save the date. Because they want you to prepare. Mm -hmm. And... And 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 the <laughs> and, and and the good thing about this is if I concur with the announcement, if I agree with the announcement, I will begin to alter or set plans in accordance to what has been announced. Don't look at me that don't look at me with that tone. You you know you've heard some folks that they were getting married and you didn't have any faith in it. You didn't concur. All right, I'm in the wrong church. Uh, so if if you concur, you you make adjustments, you go into your calendar, you place this date and time on your schedule. You put the announcement up on the refrigerator to remind you. You, you do things because they have announced their intentions. So you can begin to, because they are trying to elicit your participation. 
They want you there. And bring a gift. And when somebody is going to get married and they send you an invitation, an announcement, you have faith that it's going to work. You don't know, but you have faith. That's why you invest in the gift. Announcements. Announcements about the plan. Announcement about the declaration. Jesus is coming. Jesus is going to be born into the world. That is the announcement. Uh, it comes. It comes through uh, prophets. It comes uh, through the. The angel Gabriel, who tells, who tells Mary, you shall bring forth a son and you shall name him Jesus and he shall be the savior of the world. There is this announcement. There is this declaration. But not only were there announcements given by prophets and announcements given uh, to Mary, but our text begins to speak to some announcements that were given to individuals who were not necessarily involved. Uh, the Bible lets us know that we have at this time, it is the time of Jesus being brought to the temple. And it's the time of purification and circumcision of the child and the purification of the mother. It is on the eighth day that the children are brought to be, the boys are brought to be circumcised and to be named. We talked about that last week with John the Baptist. But then also there is this time of purification for the mother as well. And so they come to this process. And the Bible lets us know that here they are entering into the temple and Mary and Joseph are bringing baby Jesus. According to the law's custom, they're bringing him to the temple to do what's right, to purify, to circumcise, and to, uh, and to dedicate him unto the Lord. But while they are bringing him, the text is invaded by another individual, the man by the name of Simeon. All right. Now, here's what's very interesting, because Simeon is not in the family line of Jesus. Simeon is not the stepdaddy. He's not the play uncle. He's not the mother. Simeon is somebody who's really based upon all practical purposes, which seem to have no importance in the scenario. But here's why Simeon is important, because Simeon had heard an announcement even before y'all not talking even before Mary was told she would give birth to Jesus all right y'all don't believe it all right look at what he said look at verse 25 and behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon this man was just and devout hmm. he's righteous he's living holy He's righteous and devout. Righteousness speaks to his relationship with God. Devout means that he is fulfilling his religious duties. We have to be careful in today's world that we don't lose some things trying to be deep. You see, nowadays, everybody won't talk about, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Well, be spiritual. But the reality is, if you're going to serve God, you still got to have some religious things. All right, that's, that, that's for another message. And so here he is. He's, he's religious, he's devout, he's righteous, and he's devout. And the text says he is waiting for the consolation of Israel. He is waiting for the consolation of Israel. He is religious. He is righteous. And he is waiting for the, the coming of the Messiah. He's, he's, he's in expectation. Have you ever had expectations that seem to be delayed? 
Have you ever had, have you ever been looking for something, but what you're looking for seems to take too long to get here? Here, you're, here he is, Deke. He's, he's, he's waiting for the consolation of the Lord. He's waiting for this Messiah that has been prophesied. But then, uh, uh, and the text says, in the end of verse 25, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. He says he's waiting, he's spiritual, he's righteous, he's devout, he's in, he's waiting his expectation of the Lord. But what happens? He is, the spirit of God is upon him. Why is that important? Hold on, we'll get there. And then verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by that same Holy Spirit that he would not see death. Before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Oh God. So, so here he is. He's in delay Aisha. But in delay he yet has purpose. All right, somebody missed it. See, there come some times in which we begin to think that because God's not answering quick enough that we must be wrong, we've done something wrong, we're in bad standing, but there comes a time you have to tell yourself, even in the midst of my delay, my delay does not change the purpose God has for me. So he says, you will not die, you will not see death, that's die, you will not see death until the return, uh, until uh, you have seen the Lord's Christ. And then verse 27 says, so he came by the Spirit. Remember I told you, they said he was, he had, he had been touched, he, the Holy Spirit was upon him, and now he enters the temple being led by the Holy Spirit. He goes to church, but he's led by the Spirit. He doesn't wait to get to church to feel the Spirit. He's, he's led by the Spirit to church. Okay, I'm in the wrong place. Let's try over here. He, he doesn't wait until they hit the right chords and they sing the right song. The Bible said he is led by the Spirit. Why is this significant? Because the text lets me know not only is he led, but he's led to the temple at the right time. He's, he's here. He, he, he comes. And, and, and for those of you who study your Bible real well, this is the same language that is used in, when they talk about Jesus being led into the wilderness when he's tempted of the devil. It's the same Holy Spirit leading him. What would happen if more of us would come to church led? Oh, God, I must, be, <laughs> I must be in the wrong place. What if we came to church already led, knowing that God has already touched us and stirred us? I, I, maybe you've been saved too long to remember how it was when you were in the world and you might have had a little gin and juice, a little something, something. You didn't wait to go to the party or to the game to get a little something to drink. You had a little bit before. All right, I'm in the wrong place. You, you got yourself to, see y'all too deep. Okay, I'm sorry. You came even before you went to the party. You already prepared yourself. You pulled out your clothes, you ironed them, you got them ready, and you, and you had a fashion show in your own room. You were preparing yourself. You were practicing how you would walk in the room while folk were checking you out because you were being led by something prior to you getting there. Uh, the Bible says Simeon is led by the Spirit into the temple. Now, this is not unusual because the Bible said he was a righteous and devout man. But this time, it's different. Because this time he enters the heart, enters the temple pulsing at the same time Mary and Joseph are bringing baby Jesus. Now remember we read that he had been told he would not see death Yolanda until he saw the Lord's Christ. 
and the spirit leads him into the temple at this time, Adrian, in which Joseph and Mary happen to be bringing Jesus in to just fulfill the tradition of the day. Look how the spirit orchestrates some things. Good God from on high. He, he's, Simeon is walking because the Holy Ghost is leading him. Mary and Joseph are walking because it's time to go fulfill purpose. But what happens is the Holy Ghost knows the purpose that other people don't recognize. And so the Holy Ghost has him at the right place at the right time. And here's what I see, Lady Davis. He does not see a grown man. He does not see someone wearing a king's crown and a royal robe. He sees a baby. He, all right, we missed it. He sees a baby. And when he sees, that's a little baby, ain't it? But anyway, he sees, it's the best we're working with right now. He sees, it's only eight days. Ain't much bigger than that. Anyway, he sees the baby. And what is amazing is, as he sees the baby, he recognizes that what is in small form is what God has already declared is coming. All right, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm preaching over heads right now. Allow me to bring it down. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to help you. He, he, he's, he's saying, he says, look, and then look, look at his response. His response is he rolls up to them and he grabs the baby. And he takes the baby in his arms and lifts him up to God. And then Simeon declares, Lord, this, this is 21st century version. Now I can.